Grab your Bibles and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Um, we're going to talk and share there and allow God to be God in your midst. Yeah, amen. Hallelujah, 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 God. This is just good to be in the presence of God. There ain't nothing like worshiping God and the beauty of his holiness. I just love it. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 11 reads this way. Now, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe and get vain. For I deliver to you as of first importance what I also receive, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the twelve, and then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at the same time, most of whom are still alive, though some has fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James and to all the apostles, and last of all, as the one untimely born, he appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Come on, say, I am what I am. <laughs> say it again, say, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain, on the contrary, I work harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. So whether then it was I or they, so we preach and so you believe. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, there is power in the resurrection of Jesus. Come on, tell your other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, there is power in the resurrection of Jesus. I want to take the next few, minutes, the few remaining minutes that we have and just kind of flesh this out and talk about this a little bit. The Bible opens up in the book of Psalms, chapter 51 and uh, verse 5, by David writing, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And what David means by that particular passage of Scripture is that when we first enter the earth, we are born into sin, and if we don't do something different, the sinful state becomes our default state. Does that make sense? So what that means is this, by default, once naturally born into the world, if we continue on the path that we're in, we, end, we will die and go straight to hell apart from God. Sad commentary, but that's the truth of what Scripture teaches, and that's the truth of what it is. The problem with that is, is we are born into the world and until or unless we encounter Christ, we mistakenly believe that the life we're living is God's preordained purpose and destiny for us. So what happens is we go around living life, doing things the way we do it, the way we know how, and we just, we just do us. And so we make mistakes, we blow it, we do all that stuff, and a lot of us fool ourselves into thinking that's the natural way to do stuff. Come on, you ever heard people say, I've been born that way? Come on, y'all heard that. We, we, we heard that. We've all heard, we've all heard those things. And this truth, this truth is illustrated. And, and well, let me back, back up. And a change needs to take place for us to become who God really wants us to be. This truth is illustrated in, in John chapter 3 in the story of Nicodemus. And most of you know Nicodemus. Nicodemus was this religious ruler who came to Jesus by night because he was born and by default he was doing what Nicodemus does, which was collecting tax, robbing people, taking advantage of people. And he encountered God. And here's the question he said to Jesus when he encountered him. He realized that something was off in the way he was doing things. So he said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Here is Jesus' response to him. Marvel not, he said, I say unto you, what must happen? You must be what? Y'all know it. Born again. Come on, say born again. Now that concept of being born again, I, I find it very, very interesting because in my, in my maturity, on the age where I'm at right now, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish I could, in the literal sense of the word, be born again, Right? I wish in the literal sense of the word I can get a second chance because in my former life or my earliest start, I messed that up. Don't go, oh, 
You need to say, me too, preacher. Yeah, 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 because you messed it up too. We messed it up. Come on, we messed it up. My wife and I jokingly say all the time, we do a lot of traveling and we like to have fun. If, if we could rewind the clock, all the funds that we've had and the resources and financial resources we've had over the years up until you reach the age that we are right now, had we known better, we would have done differently with our money. Come in, am I by myself? Come on, y'all, am I by myself? Own houses and own lands and, as opposed to buying shoes and purses and hats and suits. Come on. And gold tooth. It's not just me. Y'all know I'm telling the truth. Amen. Yeah, we'd have done better. We'd have done better. And we wish we had a second chance. But I stopped by long enough to tell you this morning, because of what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary, we can get a second chance. Do I have any witnesses here this morning? So here's, here's what that looks like. Here's what that looks like. The power of Jesus' resurrection is such that it reverses the curse of our past and offers anyone who believes an opportunity for a new start. Isn't that good news? Come on, if you believe it, say amen. That's good news. That the power of Jesus' resurrection is such that, I like that, it's such that, it reverses the curse of our past and offers anyone who believes an opportunity for a fresh start. So it's with that I want to look at this text that's in front of us and find out a little more of what Paul was talking about when he talked about the power of the resurrection. What was going on that we need to realize that gives Christians or the believers in Christ the advantage today and why we celebrate what we do. When you look at this book of Corinthians that's in front of us, just to back up a little bit by way of context, Paul is providing or laying down what I'm going to refer to as house rules or equipping the believers in Christ and how to continue their life and to live their life. In chapter 11, he talks about what it's like to have the Lord's Supper, how to bring order in that. In chapter 12, he talks about the spiritual gifts, right, and the importance of everyone using their gift within the context of the body. In chapter 13, he talks about using those gifts, absent love creates chaos, but if we can learn to love as the most predominant gift, the church would be better off. Chapter 14, he talks about the gift of prophecy, right, and how prophecy ought to be conducted. And he talks about orderly worship in that same 14th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians. And then in chapter 15, he talks about the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the believer. And the reason that's, that's important, because I'm, I'm led to believe if Paul were preaching that message, it was probably a resurrection Sunday, and God just led him down that path. And he opens up in the first 11 verses by talking about how Jesus rose from the dead and the importance of that. And then he segues down in the remainder of the chapter that says, just like Jesus was raised from the dead, you and I, or the believers in Christ, we too, like Christ, will be raised from the dead, and let me add, with a resurrected body. Come on, isn't that good news? That we too will be raised from the dead. So as we look at this text, as we look at what Paul was saying, there's three paramount things that I want you to take away from the message as we talk about the power of the gospel this morning. And the first one being that it's very important for us to understand that the heart of the gospel, the heart, the heart of this gospel that we preach, when you heard the word gospel, what's that all about? It's the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I cannot overstate that point enough. It's the message of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And I want to pick up in the middle of the passage, but to get there, let me read the first couple of verses. Verses 1 and 2, he says, Now, I would like to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preach to you, which you receive and in which you stand, and by which he has this interesting phrase, you are being saved if you hold fast to the word I preach to you unless you believe in vain. Now look at verse 3. Here's what Paul says as it talks about what the gospel means. For I delivered you of first importance what I would have you receive, that Christ died for your sins in according with the scripture. Come on, say Christ died for me. And he says, secondly, he was buried, and third, he was raised on the third day in according with the Scriptures. And he goes on in verses 5 through 7 to lay out for us eyewitnesses to the fact 
that Christ died. Now, before we talk briefly about this whole issue of what does it mean for him to die, what does it mean for him to be buried, and what does it mean for him to be um, to be raised, it's important that we understand what the definition of the gospel message is. And this will help us shape this morning because this, this excites me. Here's a quick definition, a technical definition. The gospel message is that by grace, God has acted decisively to save all humans, Jews and Gentiles, through Jesus Christ alone, apart from the law and human performance. Now, that people, listen, listen. That phrase, human performance, plays a critical role because what it tells me is that I don't have to go to that cross of Calvary to die because Jesus did it for me. Come on, y'all. It, it also means, it also means there is no work that I can perform to save myself. Oh, come on, y'all. Come on. That Jesus paid it all and that he did it all for me. And he didn't only do it for me, but he did it for the entire world, which we see in the third chapter, 16th verse of John. So here is how you might have heard the gospel to be defined, right? The truth of the message of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Let me say it again. The definition you might know of the gospel is the truth of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Come on, y'all say that to me. Say the truth of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I want you, when you leave here, say you've heard this here, and you might have heard it other places. No other denomination or religion has a gospel to present because there's not a truth about a death, a burial, and a resurrection of their Savior. Oh, y'all look like deer in headlights. The reason we're excited tonight is the gospel is the truth of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Listen to what the text says, right? He says, for I delivered to you, he says, first of all, of first importance, this is very important, what I also received, and he says that Christ died and he adds the phrase, for our sins, according to Scripture. And I said this this morning, I'm going to say it again right now. I wish you all were here and this place was packed out today like it was on Wednesday night. Because we had some men and women, our pastoral staff preach, and man, they brought a word. And one of the points that was laid out, Pastor Vernon said this, is that don't fool yourself into thinking that someone killed Jesus. Oh, uh, y'all, y'all, yeah, 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 yeah. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, didn't nobody kill him. Yeah, Vernon puts it this way. I'm going to steal this because it's so good stuff. He says, if you go ask the Roman soldiers and you try to find out who killed him, he said, you'll end up with a cold case. <laughs> Are you, come on, y'all. Ain't that some good stuff? That, that's good stuff. That's, so, so don't fool yourself into thinking that nobody killed him. The reason that's important is because when the time comes for me to die, my death is not going to be on your behalf. I love you, but, but there's nothing I could do in my death to save you. Are you hearing me? I love my family, but there's nothing I can do in my death to save my family. When I die, I'm either going to be old or I'm going to be sick or something catastrophic may have happened that have ended me. And here's what you're going to say, oh, he was a good guy. That's assuming you're my friend. You, you kind of get where I'm going. You, you get where I'm going, right? But, but here's what you need to know. The purpose of Jesus' death, the Bible says he died for our sins. And the fact that the text says it's according to Scripture means that it was woven throughout the pages of Scripture, the prophecy that God was going to send his son to die in our place. Here's the way it worked in the Old Testament. The Old Testament cultic sacrificial sin system says when a person sinned, what would happen is a lamb would be taken and they would kill the lamb and the blood of the lamb would atone for the sin of people. Here's the importance that Paul says of Jesus' death is that the death of Christ on that cross of Calvary ended the need for any lamb to die in our place because Jesus paid it all. Oh, come on, do I have a witness? 
That's good news. That's good news. And let me say this right now. And here's what you need to know. There is no sin you could ever commit from this day forward that God's going to sit in heaven and say, how did I miss that one? I want you all to hear that. Because here's what that means. Every sin that we will ever commit, past, present, and future, what he did over 2,000 years ago on that cross of Calvary, his blood, blood paid it all. The hymnist put it this way, Jesus paid it all, he said. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but his blood has washed it white as snow. So the good news of Easter Sunday morning, the good news that begins all this, that makes it so important, is that Jesus' death on the cross of Calvary died in my place because I should have been the one on the cross. Oh, come on, come on, come on. You should have been there. We were the guilty ones, but he atoned for our sins in our place. He died. And not only did he die, the text says he was also buried. Come on, say he was buried. Say it again, say he was buried. Now, don't make the mistake of connecting the burial and the resurrection because he didn't need to be buried for him to be raised. I'm going to flesh through this. The reason he was placed in the grave, I want you all to hear this, is because the, the, the teaching was in Palestine at the time that when a person dies, their spirit would hover around for a couple of days just in the event the person might have been comatose or might have been sick or they might have been resuscitated such that when they arose, the Spirit would re-enter them, making them whole again. So what Jesus did, he wanted to dispel the myth, and in his death, he stayed in that grave. The verse said, for three days, eliminating any myth that he was just asleep. So listen what he said when he died. Father, into thy hand I do what? I commend my spirit just in case there's any spiritualist or any person looking around to see if my spirit is hanging around so they can come up with the lie. He really didn't die. He was just asleep. Let me let them see that I'm going to stay in that grave for three days to dispel any myth. He was buried. And he stayed there. Died, buried. But he got up. Oh, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. The text says he was raised. Now, now what I like about the phrase he was raised is that it has some interesting grammatical nuances in the Greek that really makes this text, that, that brings this text alive. And once again, I wish y'all was here Wednesday because Karen, uh, Pastor Karen did such justice with the perfect tense, right? She, I, I said this morning, I have nothing to say. Because she preached the perfect silly. And, 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 and what the perfect tense is, that when it says he was raised, notice he, he died, he was buried. And those are all in the aorist tense, meaning that it happened. But then when it got to he was raised, the verb tense changes intensely. This is very, very important. Because it's written now in what they call in Greek grammar the perfect tense and the passive voice. Now, here's the importance of that. This is what Pastor Karen said. I learned some Greek from her the other night. Um, here's what it says. The perfect tense says is that something happened in the past. Am I getting it right, Pastor Karen? And then it has ongoing results into the future. Okay? Now, now the emphasis of the perfect is not what happened in the past. The emphasis is what's happening right now. And the, what I love about the text when it said he was raised, perfect tense, meant that he's still alive. I wish I had somebody. Yeah, yeah. It, it meant, it meant, it meant that because God raised him up, there is nothing that could end his life, and he's still alive today. Come on, y'all. Grandma them, Grandma them used to have a song that they sing that said something like this. I serve a risen Savior, and he's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever man may say. Come on, some of y'all know this. I see his hands of mercy. I hear his voice of cheer. And they didn't know what the perfect tense meant, but they say this, and just the time I need him. He's always what? Here, yeah. Then they say he lived. 
Christ Jesus lives today. And they repeat the perfect. He walks with me. He talks with me. Come on. A long life, narrow way. 2,000 years ago, and he's still alive right now. That's good news. Come on, that's good news. You ask me how I know he lives? Come on, y'all. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so when the text says in a perfect tense, he was raised, 2,000 years ago God raised him up, and he's still alive today. Now that's paramount because the perfect tense was not used in Lazarus' resurrection. This is important. There are other people who were raised from the dead biblically, and the perfect tense was not used in their resurrection, which is why they're back in. Yeah, you get it. Perfect passive. Here's the passive voice. The passive voice says, Jesus did not raise himself. God raised him up. Come on, y'all know that. Come on, say amen, y'all. He didn't raise himself. God raised him up. I want to I wanna mess you up just a little bit because I'm one of those crazy preachers that will say, yes, he did. He, he raised himself, even though I know it's the passive voice. And for the lay people, God raised him up. But for those that are a little deeper, he did raise himself. Because here's what, if you understand the Trinity, it says one God, eternally existence in what? Three person. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God what? The Holy Spirit. Here's what you need to know about your doctrine of the Trinity. All three of them are God at the same time. Are you with me? There's never a time that the Holy Spirit stops being God. There's never a time that Jesus stops being God or else he would unplug himself from the Trinity. But by virtue of the fact he's part of the Trinity, he's always God. Come on, y'all know this. Y'all know this. So, so here's, here's what this looks like if I talk about the Trinity, right? God himself incarnated himself into flesh to come to the earth to die in my place. Come on, does this make sense? So he, and he called the flesh person, por, portion of himself, Jesus. I wish I had somebody in here. Then Jesus dies, and you've got to lock into this. Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. And I'm crazy enough to believe, even though he's Jesus and God at the same time, the whole time that fleshly body was buried, God was buried in the tomb, but he was in the tomb and he was in heaven. At, I wish I had somebody at the same time because that body never stopped being God. Come on, are you hearing me? And so when it came time for him to get up three days later, even though he said, Lord, into thy hand I commend my spirit, because he was in the grave and he was in the heaven at the same time. Come on, I hope you're getting this. I hope you're getting this. He, he could reinsert himself in himself. This is why he says it this way in John chapter 10. Nobody takes my life unless I lay it down. Then he says in verse 18, if I have the authority to lay it down, guess what I can do? I can pick it up all over again. This is Jesus talking, not God talking. So you've got to see this. On that third day morning, while he's laying in that grave, come on, come on, and the time got right, he said, I've been here long enough. It's time for me to get up. And the God that was in that body was able to raise himself from the dead. Church, that's deep. Because what dead person you know can raise themselves? In case you're missing this, the reason Mr. Buddha is still in the grave is because he was man like Jesus. And like Jesus, he died. But the problem was, unlike Jesus, he was not God, so he's still in the grave. Are oh, y'all not hearing me? The reason Elijah Muhammad is still in the grave for my Muslim friends, because he was man like Jesus. And like Jesus, he died. But unlike Jesus, he was not God, so he couldn't raise himself. The reason Joseph Smith is still in the grave, that's my moment, friend, 
because he was man like Jesus. And like Jesus, he died and was in the grave. But unlike Jesus, he was not God, so he couldn't raise himself. Come on now. The reason David Koresh Nila Goon is still in the grave, because like Jesus, he was man. And like Jesus, he died. But unlike Jesus, I wish I had somebody in here. He couldn't raise himself from the grave. For all my Rastafarian friends, the reason Hail Selassie is still in the grave, come on, y'all not hearing me, is because he was man like Jesus. And like Jesus, he died. But unlike Jesus, ah, come on, y'all. Unlike Jesus, he was able to raise himself. But my God, my Jesus, my Lord, my Savior, Grandma would say, my lily of the valley, my bright and morning star, my bread when I'm hungry, my water when I'm thirsty, my way maker, come on. He died, and because he was God, when the time got right, he got up from that grave with all power in his hand, and the grave could not keep him in. When I tell you I serve a risen Savior, don't tell me the God that I serve is dead. Talk about your own God. But leave my God alone. Your God might not walk with you. He might not talk with you. But my God, are you hearing me this morning? The God that I serve, the God that gives me breath, the God that gives me the activity of my limb, the God that raises me up every morning, that God, he's alive. He's alive. He's alive. He's alive. That God, he's alive. And the grave could not keep him. Come on, are you hearing me? The grave, the grave, the grave. The grave could not keep him in. So if I, y'all see me take my shoes off like Pastor Vernon. I got two of the same socks on. Amen. <laughs> but the grave, the grave, the grave, the grave, are you hearing me? That God, come on, say that God. Say it again, say that God. I got two more things to share with you. Let me get past this. I'm sorry, y'all. But the impact, the impact, I'm just going to say it this way. The impact now of that resurrection is that once I believe, once you believe, once we believe, it has the ability, hear this out, to keep you saved. Are you hearing me? Let me go here. Let me go here. Let me go here. Look with me at verse 1 and 2. I'm going to do this real quick. It says, I want to remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and which you take in your stand. And watch the verbal phrase, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word, I preach to you unless you believe in vain. Once again, that perfect comes back into play. That grammatical perfect that says something happened in the past and it has ongoing results. And the focus of the perfect is not so much what happened in the past as it is the current state of affairs. So when it says you're being saved... And the text says it can keep everyone saved. It doesn't mean that you're not saved yet. It's talking about the sanctification process. Let me tell you what that means. You gave your heart to God and you got saved. Hear this out, hear this out. And what it's saying, the same God that keeps Jesus alive is the same God that keeps you saved. Oh, my gosh, I wish I had. I wish I had. Y'all, that's a shout right there. That's a shout right there. Because here's what will happen. Right now, you'll mess up. Right now, you'll sin. Right now, you'll blow it. And here's what the enemy will do. He will come into your ear and he will whisper and say to you, see, you can't possibly be saved because look at what you're doing. I wish I had somebody in here. 
Here's when I define the gospel. Salvation comes outside of performance. Because what you're doing right now, 2,000 years ago, it was already covered by the blood. I wish I had somebody in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. So the enemy is defeated because the gospel has the power to keep us saved as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus. Turn your neighbor and say, neighbor, we're going to make it in. <laughs> yeah, come on, tell the other neighbor. Say, other neighbor, we're going to make it in. Because the gospel has the power to keep you. I want you all to hear me. The focus is the resurrection. That's the core. That's the heart. That's the driving part. And the, more, the second thing, more importantly, is the impact that it has once we believe the gospel. So here's what Paul says to Corinth. I want to remind you. I want to remind you of the gospel you received. A first important Christ died. He was buried and he was raised. And he backs up to verse 2, chapter, I mean verse 1 and 2 and say, listen, that same resurrection power is able to keep you. So here's what happens when the enemy comes to you and makes you feel unsaved. Get thee behind me. Oh, I wish I had somebody. Get thee behind me. Get thee behind me. Third thing, then I move on. Third thing. Here's the third thing real quick. Now the power of this resurrection is its transformative power to give anyone who believes a new start. That's good news. Come on, y'all. That's, 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 come on, y'all. That's good news. Lewis, we're thanking God for a new start, right? Fresh start. So, so here's what Paul says. Watch this. Watch this. Watch, look, jump all the way down to verse 8. He says, last of all, after he got through the list of people who saw Christ, he appeared to me untimely born, my translation says. Some of your Bible says abnormally born. Or some of your translations might say, born before time. Okay? He appeared to me, and watch what he says in verse 9. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle. And watch why. Because I persecuted the church of God, but by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though I, it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. Whether then it was I or, or they... So we preach and so we believe. Come on, say abnormal. Say untimely. It's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, Greek word. Ekthroma is the root. And, and here's, here's how the word is used in biblical context, specifically in the Old Testament, right? When you see that word in the Septuagint, this is the Greek Old Testament, ekthroma. Here's what it means. That a woman had a miscarriage, so the baby was untimely born. Or abnormally born. Make sense? Or she had an abortion. She aborted the process. So the baby was abnormally born. Or the baby was premature. So the baby was abnormally born. Does that make sense? Interesting when you read the text. Here's what Paul says about himself. I was abnormally born. And when you read that text, that Greek word ekthroma, a lot of scholars look at that and they say the reason Paul used the phrase abnormally born is because he's making reference to the fact that unlike Peter, James, John, Andrew, Bartholomew, Thaddeus, and Thomas and those guys who had a chance to walk with Jesus, I did not get that benefit so I was born after Jesus was ascended. And some theologians said or scholars say that's what Paul is referring to. I differ with those guys, and I take the position of some scholars who say that when Paul uses the term abnormally born, he is making reference to what he was before he came to Christ. Yeah. Let me tell you what I mean by that. In other words, Psalms 51 and 5, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. So here's what that means. My birth was premature, and because I really didn't know who I was, I went about doing some things I should not have been done. Come, come on, does this make sense? So my abnormality is my life before Christ outside of God. 
So here I am going about persecuting the church. Look at the text. I don't deserve to be an apostle because pre-Christ I persecuted the church. I killed Christians. I did all this stuff. You had a premature and untimely a miscarriage and aborted fetus that ended up living and it was living out of purpose and destiny and it was not until I met Christ, watch this, that I was born again. I wish I had somebody. And then now, because of the resurrection, I am given a fresh start, and I am given a new start. Y'all remember Nicodemus. Here's Nicodemus, right? Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, bruh, you've been abnormally born. Guess what needs to happen? You've got to be yeah, you get it now. You get it now. You got to be born again. And it's no different than them. It's the same with me, and it's the same with you. Before Christ, miscarriages, abortions, premature babies. So here's what we did. Lying, stealing, cheating. Oh, I know it's Easter. Don't act like I'm talking to a bunch of strangers. Somebody ought to holler, that was me, preacher. Don't say it out loud or they'll know it was you. you know? And come on, y'all, fornicating and adultery and drugs and alcohol and stealing and doing all kinds of stuff because we were born, but we weren't born yet. We were before Christ, and because we didn't know God, we were doing things outside of God. The resurrection says... You don't have to stay that way, baby. I wish I had somebody. The resurrection says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The Greek word means that God literally remakes you. He gives you a new talk. He gives you a new walk. He gives you a new song. He gives you a new dance. He gives you a new reason to live because he makes you over. So who I was yesterday, it's not who I am. Come on, come on, come on. Today, and it's not who I'm going to be tomorrow because he's given me a new start. I don't know about you, but man, I thank God for the resurrection because of the power of the resurrection. Here's Paul. I am what I am. I don't deserve it, but God did it, and today I am what I am. So here's how we want to end this Easter morning. Come on, worship team. Is that if you're like me, there's some of us in here that didn't realize what God did for us. And so now we have an opportunity to make it new. And on this Easter Sunday morning that you've come out to worship God, the Bible is clear when it says, behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So here's what that means. Here's what that means. If you're here and you're living in the old state, here's how, what I said throughout the whole message. You don't have to stay that way. God can change you. God can remake you. The stronghold that the enemy may have or whatever it is, those curses, those things that have you stuck, that have you bound on this Easter morning, because God raised Jesus from the dead, he's able to raise and deliver you. We don't have to stay there. We can defeat the enemy today. But it takes holding fast to that resurrection. So here's what I'm going to say. If that's you, we want to give you a chance to come. And maybe, 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 maybe you say, you know, I knew better and I've strayed away and God is saying it's time to come back and make it right. If that's you, God is saying come. So I want to invite you to stand with us this morning. And we're going to allow, come on, stand to your feet. We're going to allow God to move. We're going to take a moment on this Easter Sunday morning to say, God, move in this place. Believers, we need you praying. God, have your way. Yes, God.